Is that you banging, Nicola? Yeah, I've got an ominous buzzing in my living room. I'm just opening a few things to let the perpetrator of the buzzing out. Welcome to Own It, Your Business and Your Life, with Nicola Cairncross and Judith Morgan. In this podcast, we're going to cover everything you need to embrace to become a successful entrepreneur, marketing, money, and much, much more. How to create a business doing just what you love. How to own it, your business and your life. This one will be fast, funny, feisty, and very lively. So sit back and enjoy the show. Nicola, I'm fine. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. It's been a stonking week in Greece. Oh, good, good. I'm pleased. Stonking in what sense? Well, there's been lots of things. I've got two funny stories to tell you about Greek domestic life. Okay. I know how much you love those. <laughs> yes. Are you going to tell me those in the first section about your week? Well, yeah. why don't you start then? All right, I will. So you may have seen I put out a plea for wood on Facebook this week. <laughs> it was yes, and got a lot of sort of semi-pornographic replies. I know, very funny. Matt, Matt Duggan being the worst amongst them. <laughs> yes, Matt Tisk. <laughs> Tisk, Matt, indeed. <laughs> but uh, no, it was very, it was very funny, and it reminded me of the, the funniest book I've ever read, which is actually uh, Vicky Corrance. Uh, you know, she she married um, the chap from. Yes. You know, I can't remember. Yes, his name. I do. Very David funny. Mitchell. David that's Mitchell. Vicky mm. Corrin Mitchell, that's her yes. name. Yes. <laughs> of course, them. you're the only person in the world to call her Vicky. She uses that in some in her poker sense, doesn't she? She does, yes. Yeah. And she wrote a book that is one, one of the funniest books I've ever read that made me laugh out loud lots of time, which is called Once More With Feeling, which is all about how her and her mate ended up making a porn movie. And it's just the, be- the funniest book I've ever read. But uh, no, I got several offers of wood, and one of the most attractive was from a gentleman called Mackie, who lives over at the other side of Agius Demetrius, and he said, I will be delivering your wood uh, pr- tomorrow or the next day. <laughs> They're nice <laughs> and vague, right? And it's like 80 euros a, lo- a load, a load being one cubic metre of wood cut to size for wood stoves. And uh, I said, well, I'll have two, I'll have two cubic meters if you've got it, because then it will stand me in good stead for the rest of this, this spring and, um, and next winter. It'll be well seasoned by then, you see. So I'm not sure he might turn up in the middle of this recording. I have got the money for him, which is good. I had to pop out early to get that because, um, because my car's been taken off to Kalamata. Sayat have apparently recalled all the cars, you know, oh. the cars. And I couldn't drive it to Kalamata because I'm very busy today. It's my only day. I can't do things like that. And I'm glad for that. But they said, could you drop it down the office by nine o'clock? And I thought, well, I've got to go get some money for Mackie. And I've got to go and um, get some pills from the chemist. So I went off and dro- did those chores. And I sent them a little email saying, no, I can't really drop it down there because then I have to walk up the hill and I'll be late for my first appointment. But uh, no problem at all. I sent them a little screenshot of a, the Google map of where I lived. And they passed that on to the gentleman who was picking up my car to take to Kalamata, who turned out to be my cleaner's husband. Oh. There. <laughs> so <laughs> and it was just so... What's the word I'm looking for? Provincial. You know, like every, everyone was connected, you know. Yes, so yes. nothing's ever a problem. Everything's connected. I got a great big hug from Albert when he turned up. And he, he's taken my car off to Kalamata to be, to be looked at. And the final good thing about this week is my new VA is settling in brilliantly. She's following oh, Sarah's videos and tick lists. She's asking lots of intelligent questions. Her English is fantastic. She works really until two or three in the morning, which means that she's around late afternoon, early evening for me. So we're able to communicate quite well and it's all going marvellously. Well, what's the moral of that story? Well, I was, I was very worried about the whole working with someone in the Philippines because of the time difference. It's not so bad in, in, when you're in Greece because it's two hours ahead here. But the moral of the story is that she's, her, how, her husband looks after her little boy and she earns money more than she could ever earn in the Philippines by mm, work. Mm, no, the moral of the story is all that anxiety was a complete waste of effort. I know. Life I juice. Know. Yeah. I get worried about things like, you know, getting more wood and having enough money. Well, I, you know, I'm not a worrier, but I've started to become one. I wonder if it's something to do with, you, you know, getting on a bit. 
But one thing about Greece, it teaches you, you know, avrio is the most important expression out here, which means probably tomorrow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I'm not sure that's good enough. But actually, you are managing to bully them into operating like the UK, where Google Maps are employed so that people collect cars. And it was all a bit hit and miss. And we don't know where you live, so we can't do things yeah. for you for quite a long time but they're yeah, catching up well, i think i made that worse because i just assumed that everyone was incapable and um, and you know i was the only person who knew what they were doing but uh, that's interesting isn't it where we move into a new environment and try to actually lots of my clients do this move into a new environment and try to force it to work the way we know rather than the way that's already working absolutely fine yes <laughs> <laughs> and the lady from the the, the car place dropped albert off um outside my house and then he said, oh, I'll bring it back here later on because he lives around the corner. So that was quite, quite convenient. So I don't Al Albert name. doesn't sound like a very Greek name. It's Albanian. Ah, there we go. Yes, yes, exactly. Okay. But yeah, well, his wife's called Vera. That's not very Greek either, is it? <laughs> or Albanian. <laughs> no, I, don't, I don't know. We, we, it might be. It's more Greek sounding than Albert. Albert sounds French almost. Yeah, I, might be, I might be mispronouncing that. Ah, okay. All right. Don't get overexcited. Yeah, you know how I love words and derivations. Yeah. So what's your week been like then? Ah, well, I'm going to give you a little synopsis of movies because uh, coming up this weekend is the BAFTAs. In fact, by the time this goes out, we'll know the results of the BAFTAs. And the Oscars is the end of the month, so I've got a couple more weeks yet. You know I love film very much. But this year, oddly, I feel less concerned than ever to be an absolute completist than I have in earlier years. Normally I put myself through this sort of rather hellish thing where I have to watch 25 movies in two or three months in order to catch up by these false deadlines of the... Um, um, uh, sit up all night, watch the award ceremonies, which I do quite like. I must put that in my diary so that I don't do anything on the Monday after Oscar. Anyway, um, I, I'm not sure why I feel more relaxed about it this year. I tried to work it out and I think it's because I don't go to the cinema anymore because what we used to do was, you know, you'd go on opening night on the Friday in London, which is quite a Londonish type of thing to do. But now I prefer in every sense to stream movies at home, which means you don't always get to say that, see the latest stuff or you have to wait a few days or a few weeks or a few months and some of the sort of online streaming sites not even necessarily the ones we know like Netflix but the ones like the Curzon Cinema sometimes they they launch digitally at the same time as physically and I feel that will be the future for movies it doesn't matter where you watch it or how you watch it you can watch it when you like from where you like you know because that's the direction that everything's moving in and one of the quite a lot of the nominees are funded by Amazon which as you know is a is a streaming platform or for me is a streaming platform anyway so I thought I'd give you a little roundup uh, the two I haven't seen yet that I would like to see very much are Bohemian Rhapsody because oh, yeah. Rami Malek keeps winning the best Oscar award. Now that will be on Amazon in about a week. Yeah. And there's another one called Can You Ever Forgive Me, which is, a, well, actually both that and R Bohemian Rhapsody based on true stories, obviously Freddie Mercury and Bohemian Rhapsody. And uh, it's with Melissa McCarthy and Reg. You know Reg that was with Nail, Richard E. Grant? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And he's been nominated for uh, Best Supporting Actor and he was in tears because he's about my age, that he's been an actor all his adult life and he's finally got an Oscar nod, which is exciting. And um, I haven't seen that one yet, but I hope I'll be able to see that soon. And Melissa McCarthy is, um, you know, for a long time played sort of jokey fat parts, but is actually a very good actress and is coming into her own. Uh, so I can't comment on those. They're in my wish list. But my favourite film so far is something called Green Book, also based on a true story, which is about um, a black musician um, travelling in the South in America uh, when racial prejudice was much worse or segregation still existed. And so he has to, draw, has to hire a, a white Italian driver, who's also a bit of a racist, to drive him round. And the Green Book was the name of a book where black people could stay. So a bit like a Michelin guide, if you were black, you had to travel with the Green Book and look up to see where you could stay. And often his white driver wouldn't be staying in the same hotel with him. Madness. Anyway, it turns out all right. It's basically a true story. It's been manipulated a bit to make it more Hollywoodish, but it, it, I liked it. And um, it's got Mahershala Ali in it, and he's totally brilliant. And Viggo Mortensen, who is very much underrated in my opinion. But my favourite film of this week is called The Wife, which is quite old, but Amazon only streamed it on Monday, so I was only able to catch it this week. Glenn Close is also winning the awards. It's totally brilliant. I thought that. But there's a young actor I adore 
called Timothy Chalamet. You, you probably haven't seen him in anything yet, but he's totally beautiful. And last year he was nominated for a, a love story, a gay love story called Call Me By Your Name, but he didn't win. And this year he's in something called Beautiful Boy, which is another true story. It's a father and son who've written up the sto their, their respective stories of the boy's drug addiction and, and how he came out of it. Uh, and the father was a journalist. So, you know, the, the writing that they've done between them is very good and they've turned it into a great film. Now, I haven't finished yet. I'm sorry. I'm on a bit of a rant here. <laughs> the films I didn't like, which are likely to win everything, is called The Favourite, which is a historical um comedy drama starring Olivia Coleman, who we know is brilliant, yeah. and Rachel Weiss, who's also brilliant, and Emma Stone, who's also brilliant. But I didn't like the film. Uh, it was dark and difficult. And it's about a Queen of England called Queen Anne, who nobody really knows anything about. It's sort of in the 1300s. I don't really do costume drama. And I, I don't doubt their performances were excellent, but I'm a bit blah about that one. I also didn't rate Bradley and Gaga in A Star Is Born. I don't understand the obsession with that movie. There have been like four serious versions of it in my lifetime. And it's a dreadfully upsetting story. Um, maybe you could say, I'm not even, I honestly don't know why anybody felt the need to remake it. And maybe maybe you could say it's a feminist story in its best light what happens is man discovers woman with talent they hook up she overtakes him in the talent sakes and the success you know field and he turns into a hopeless drunk well I, what why is that a story that i would enjoy the fourth time around i didn't enjoy it the first time around or the second time around or the third time around i don't i don't get it to be honest and i didn't really i didn't really intend to watch it i watched it in two goes because i started it downstairs and i thought might as well finish this off upstairs but by the time i'd got upstairs i'd forgotten i was halfway through watching it so i finished it about week, a week later and that's not really a very good recommendation is it well, I'm able to tell you, because I have been swatting hard on this stuff this oh, week. Oh, good, good. Um, that it follows a very... Um, oh, it's a story thing, is it? it yes. It's, yeah. It's a, it's a coming-of-age movie with a storyline with betrayal by your mentor as one of the um, required scenes. Yeah, but it's not, it's, not a, it's not an easy watch. Well, I don't know why you say that, because I quite enjoyed the first one. I haven't seen this one, but I quite... You mean the one with, um, yes, Chris Christopherson and Barbara Streisand. I found that, I mean, I was much younger then. And I found, well, when my niece asked me how to see the new one, I went, after the last one, I don't think I can... And that, how long ago was that? 30 or 40 years? I thought, I don't think I can watch that story again, because it is quite difficult to watch. It, it's like, it's exactly the same storyline as that one with um, Michael Caine and someone else. where he, he, he Oh, Educating Rita. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, I prefer that one. Mm, Pygmalion. Mm, yeah. mm, possibly. You could draw parallels, yes, about yeah. older man takes up younger. Yes, I see, what, I see where you're going with that, yes. It's a well-worn well story plot. Yes, yeah, it's, not, it's not one I like. I don't mind it in My Fair Lady, and I loved Educating Reader because the acting was good. And, of course, the only pleasure in the Bradley Cooper version is just watching Bradley, who is so physically beautiful. Yes. <laughs> Anyway, enough about film. Shall we move on? Well, that, that was my that film was my week basically, and and I don't have much to say in other sections, so I've used up the bulk of my time there. So, <laughs> what has fueled your fire? Well, interestingly enough, it leads very neatly into what's fueled my fire because I've been going um, deep dive learning on the whole story grid thing. And I've started working my way through the Story Grid podcast and I've been watching interviews and I, w I shared with you a link for a video that I think we should um, share with our listeners, which is called What It Takes to Turn Pro. And it's based, uh, based about creativity and resistance. And because, of course, the, um, the guy I'm following, Sean Coyne, he is business partners with Stephen Pressfield, who wrote, wrote The War of Art and lots and lots of other books. And one of them, I think, is called Turning Pro. And it's very well thought of in, in our circles. And I haven't actually read it yet, but I have read everything and watched everything on YouTube. I've just been absorbing everything. And it's been really, really interesting, the whole thing. And then... Joanna Penn, who is a Brit who lives in Australia, I think, or New Zealand, I'm not sure which one. She's got a website called The Creative Pen with, with double N on the pen.com. And she interviewed him all about stories and films. And she's very entrepreneurial. She's created a, a living not just as a writer, but as in um, a massive empire which helps writers to become better writers. And he's very impressed with that. And they're both part of the Seth Godin tribe. 
And I think there's some sort of community going on with Seth Godin called Tribe that I might have to go and check out because it's for creative people who want to become more entrepreneurial. So I thought your listeners, your people would very much enjoy that because they're all a lot of creative people, aren't they? Yes, and I had a conversation yesterday very, very much on that topic, actually. Yeah, and, and resistance is something that creative people really struggle with. And yes, that's true, yeah. So I think they should go and watch this What It Takes to Turn Pro, because in it in, is a protege of Sean Coyne, and that's what the podcast is all about. From, from episode one, he's taking an aspiring writer who's only ever worked in marketing in the publishing industry, and he's, he's really leading him by the hand through what it takes to become a writer, how to write, how to put storylines together, how to test things out before you've written a whole book and find out it's rubbish. And it's just absolutely fascinating. So I, when I woke up in the middle of the night about five o'clock, I don't know why I keep waking up at five o'clock, and I listened to a couple of episodes, and then um, I was listening to it last night. I've been watching YouTube videos, and I'm just immersing myself in this whole writing a book thing. And the thing I particularly like about it is they're making it visual. This Sean Coyne Coin guy is very visual. So he's making it visual for me, which is what I needed. I was trying to absorb a lot of stuff about writing through my ears, and it doesn't work. <laughs> you know, I have to see it. I have to get it through my eyes, Judith, or it doesn't work at all. Yeah. Any kind of learning. So what's fueled your fire this week? Uh, well, nothing, but I do have something to say in this section, which oh. is... Um, I, you probably saw that I tried to engage in our group and our page with our, with our listeners, our silent listeners that we don't know who they are. And uh, we had three responses, one from Scott Perez Fox, who we do know who he is because he actually um, comments quite a lot on our blog posts and things and, um, and is reasonably active in one of our groups and a chap who's a digital nomad and uh, a newish listener, another Karen, who has two lingerie shops in Cheshire. Oh. And I asked, what would you like to hear more of? And she said, new ideas to make money and investments. And so I thought what we would do, um, not today, but from today, is to put our thinking caps on and occasionally talk in uh, Focus of the Week about what is today known as the side hustle. And so I asked her, did she want to sell her shops? And she said, no, she wanted to do these things on the side. And um, I, I made a little list here of um, things. Obviously, we can't talk about investments. Um, you know, you need an IFA that you can trust to do that. Do you remember a woman called Mary Waring? Yes. Yeah, we met her through the Money Gym and she wins awards as an IFA looking after the wealth of women. So Mary Waring, W-A-R-I-N-G, is worth looking up, Karen, um, because you, you, we're not allowed to give advice like that. We can give you opinions, but we're not allowed to give advice like that. But I thought I, w I wrote down a quick list of things here where um, of my side hustles. So, you know, my books pays money every month. I have affiliate money every month. My biggest biggest financial successes have been starting creating buying and selling businesses um obviously she's generating income she may be generating um wealth through her shops too if she started them from scratch and can sell them for something i think it's relevant how old you are karen how um you know the older you are the the faster the progress you need to make relatively speaking if you're quite young you can start slow uh, I, I would say if you heard the show last week or when it was the week before when I was describing the cash flow game, she lives up in Cheshire. Try and find a cash flow game in Manchester because that's a brilliant way about learning about investments. And I thought, Nicola, we would just keep our eyes and ears open for things that model business models that we, you know, ways of making money on the side, um, the side hustle, basically. So I was, my fire was fueled by going into getting to know three of our more silent listeners well two of them are definitely i didn't know who they were before so there we go oh cool very cool yeah i mean i i have various side hustles including books and, and affiliate income as you say sometimes the affiliate income was, was what kept me going through the lean years yes you know, I, I've, I've done very well with that by recommending certain people and you know both on a one-off basis and, and on a recurring basis and in fact somebody who i met out here and talk to she's a she's got a, a blog called travels with albertine which is rather fun and her husband is a fantastic photographer and i was advising them what i would do if i was in their situation and uh, they have a holiday home in spain which they live in a lot of the time they're coming here for the summer while their spanish homes rented out to various people through airbnb which is another side hustle of course mm -hmm. 
um, and booking.com and that she just made her first 15 pence online the other day and she sent, oh, me, bless. She sent me a picture of it. <laughs> and, uh, I said to her, you know, you never forget the first no. bit you make online where you haven't actually had to do anything for it because it proves to you psychologically that it's possible. Yeah. And that fire fuels your fire to carry on, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Yeah. And his, his photographs are just stunning. So, you know, they could have a whole Etsy shop or whatever it is people do to have yes. prints. Yes. Actually, I really wanted to do that for, I've got, a, my Stupa Life group is over a thousand people now and it's, I'm not joking, it's 30, 40, 50 people joining every week who come here on holiday and I wanted to get a little shop going where we could, um, people would volunteer to put their photos up and we could let people buy, you know, those canvases and prints and things. Yes. And they would get a 50% cut of the income. You know, mm. I, I'd run the e-commerce side of it. And um, and then I went right off the idea within about two weeks. Because <laughs> it's all sounded like too much work. I think it is a nice idea, though. It is a nice idea. And the photos on the, the Super Life group are just stunning. So, you know, they would... And people, you know, with a 1,000 people, if growing up 50 people a week... I'd have a captive marketplace to buy the prints, wouldn't I? I mean, it's yes. hard to sell them. But no. I, think I need to find... There were a few people who got a little bit iffy about that when I mentioned it. Um, I did I did mention it in the group before I went anywhere with it. And um, luckily I did, because there were a few people who got very upset about it, photographers particularly. But obviously, I would never do anything without people's permission. No, quite. But they just assume that you're going to you know, that you're going to rip them off. <laughs> Some people just assume you're going to rip them off full stop. Yes. Um, so, yeah, there are lots and lots and lots of side hustles. And I, and I, you know, especially for creative people with Etsy. And, you know, Neil is still going strong. He's got over a thousand entrepreneurs making money through Amazon now. And they're, yeah. you know, they're buying stuff in wholesale from China and he's guiding them through it. And that some people I know that have joined his group are really thrilled with the quality of his tuition. So, that's definitely worth looking out, you know, or email me or something if you want those details. There's just so much. There's so much opportunity in the world, isn't there? But there is, yeah. And doing what suits you. And I think if I had two lingerie shops, I'd want to make sure, first of all, that I was making all I could out of them. Yes, I mean, or lingerie in Cheshire. I mean, that's well, that I hadn't got any, you know areas of my business I hadn't got around to focusing on yet so that it was underperforming if it's at max then I get the side hustle I mean if she you know she hopefully she's got a fantastic Instagram account because that would just bring so many people to to her and then hopefully she's got a website where people can buy well if you go to our group I don't know where she put it in our group or on our page because I invited her in both places but she's linked to the pages of both shops so you can oh, see that nice. nice so that's that's definitely what I'd be doing maximizing your online income and, and, you know, I'm, I'm now very convinced that I'm going to make money with my books because my fiction books, because I know how to write a book properly now. One that's um, much more likely to be a bestseller, whether it's self-published or published or whatever, because this Sean guy is teaching me all the elements of a fantastic story. And interesting to note there that, the, and always from the beginning, from the very first day you talked to, to us about creative writing, the ability to make money from it was very important to you. Well, it's not important as such. It's more about the, the, you know, the creative side of it. But it's a measure, isn't it? It's a measure of how well you're doing because... It's just worth noticing that it's not the same for everybody. That's the point I was no, making. I no, yeah. people in my, my writing group who just aren't bothered about that side. Yeah. Of it. I mean, some people say, they say they're quite funny because they say, oh, I'm not in it for the money, but oh, an extra 10 grand a year would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, I just remember the very, it was very, very memorable the day you went most authors only earn whatever it was. And yeah, that was, was like a pin in your balloon. But now that yeah. you've worked your way round back to seeing how you can do it commercially, that's that's inspiring to you yes but the thing that's been most wonderful about it is it's it's a hobby for life you know there's there's festivals i can go to there's groups i can join no matter where i end up in the world you know i i can see myself doing this and of course it gives me the excuse for reading fantastic books all the time yes not that one needs an excuse <laughs> well i, I did to be honest because it ah, felt like, okay it felt like reading was um a leisure activity that I should do outside work hours. Whereas now I'm actually diarising in writing time, which also includes reading time and planning time. I now feel completely at ease reading a book in the afternoon. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because <laughs> I've scheduled it. <laughs> So 
So, uh, a focus of the week. Extraordinarily, as these things happen, the focus of the week could be regarded as a side hustle. And we didn't plan that, funnily enough. This is just a happy accident. We recorded a series of interviews with our listeners a year ago. It's an interview with Anita Davenport, and it's about network marketing. And you'll hear her describe that that can be a side hustle. It can be a couple of hundred a month for a mum that works at home, or it can be a full-time business if that's what people want. But she describes it as the ultimate coaching business because she can use her coaching skills to help her team's performance. And you'll hear us say firstly that she and I met in Nicola's B&B, 14 or 15 years ago and she knows that it was then because she was pregnant with her daughter Grace who was 14 when we recorded this nearly a year ago <laughs> and you can hear in the interview that she's a fan of network marketing being either this part-time income side hustle or a business for anyone who wants and and that we the 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 network marketer can choose and she says you know she has she works with people like gps and all sorts it's not for everyone i am interested in the model especially as a coach and if i weren't a creator then i'd probably get involved with something somehow i do love selling products i believe in as you'll hear me say later and i have done that and i've always stopped if i felt the product wasn't delivering what it promised to me in my own Michael Mosley type experiment. Not to say it doesn't work, just that it didn't work for me. It needs to work for me for me to be able to sell it. Now, Anita describes having worked for a, a service-based one, which has a recurring revenue, and now a product-based one where people have to keep buying it. But let's, let's listen to Anita, shall we? So um, welcome to Anita Davenport. This is so exciting, Anita, because you know, you oh. and I, you and I met in Nicola's workshop yeah. room slash living room at the Acacia B&B in Worthing in, yeah. I reckon, 2003. Oh, it, was, uh, it was, it uh, was, yes, because I was pregnant with Grace and Grace is now 14. Oh God. And if it hadn't been for you, Nicola, I wouldn't have met Anita and the three of us wouldn't be talking today. Yeah. Well, yeah. there you go. Amazing. <laughs> I know. <laughs> And I remember that conversation. I remember so many things that were discussed in that, on that day. And um, I'm sure we'll cover it in the conversation, but things that really sort of hit a nerve with me and um, brought me to where I am now. So it's, it's funny how things work out, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. it is. Mm -hmm. Now, what we'd like you to do is take a... Uh, we've got plenty of time because you're fourth, our fourth and final. Take mm -hmm. a couple of minutes to tell the listener about you and what you're up to these days and then yeah. segue into what what you want to talk about and then we'll join in uh, we yeah. we're not very good at keeping quiet so we'll join no. in. we'll join in sooner than perhaps <laughs> either of us thought we might or you thought we might okay <laughs> yeah 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 no that's absolutely fine right so yeah so i thought that um given that we have known each other for so long and lots of water's gone under that bridge i'm sure for all of us well i know it has um and um so i wanted to talk about sort of yeah where i'm at now and why i've got to where i've got to um because i i sort of set off down the path of multiple streams of passive income you know that holy grail um just about really when i found nicola and um, came down to, to the workshop in Worthing and started off down a path of looking at lots of different ways to earn lots of different incomes. And the, the reason for that at, the, at that point was that I had two children already. I was pregnant with a third. My husband wasn't happy with what he was doing in his job. Um, I wasn't a really good employee at all I was quite naughty I didn't I didn't like it I couldn't be told what to do when to be there and all of that so things sort of come a, across your path don't they and um, and the first thing I wanted to do was property which I did very very successfully and very quickly I bought 16 properties with no money wow. in a year um, that year when I was pregnant um, but uh, time moved on and actually um, eight years ago I separated from my husband and we were in partnership in the properties and as part of everything those properties went uh, it just came to an end um, and I was very happy to do that actually I enjoyed it I love property I love property development um, but it was massively all-consuming and quite stressful and I think the last straw was when I got a call from a letting agent where there was a fire engine screaming past the estate agent because I'd, had, I'd got a void property, we couldn't rent it out, and it had been absolutely wrecked um, by thieves that had taken the copper pipes off, caused a gas leak, the whole street had been cordoned off and was about to explode. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, yeah, so, that, so I kind of, that kind of felt like a bit of an omen, really. So 
anyway, um, I, I, and I was coaching at the time. So that was kind of my, you know, what I really, really wanted to do. But I actually found it really, really difficult to coordinate having the kids, doing the property and, and get the coaching clients and coach. It's like quite a lot to do, isn't it? So yes, <laughs> I ended up going into, yeah, it, you know, you spend a lot of time bringing the business in sometimes and not actually working on the business. So, um, so I, I got approached to do some consultancy work and I ended up going into consultancy and spent many, many years doing that. But all alongside that looked constantly looking at things that I can do partly because I like to do lots of different things and also because as my children have got older I want to be this digital nomad woman you know I don't particularly want to have a roof over my head I just want to go all around the world and but I still want to work because I love working and I love working with people anyway my light bulb moment was a few years ago I was sat in a hospital, not ill, I was working, uh, trying to transform this hospital. And I sat there and I was, I was on my knees, actually. I had migraine. It was 24-7 migraine. I couldn't get rid of it. My partner at the time had been critically ill. I'd just taken five months off to be with him whilst he was going through chemotherapy. And had gone back into consulting just to bring the money in, frankly. And I just sort of sat there and thought, gosh, this, this, this is no good. This, this is my last contract. And then the 80-20 rule popped into my head, you know, the Pareto principle. Yeah. And a little voice in my head went, hang on a minute. Right, you're here. This is your day job. This is taking up most of the time that you're putting into earning an income. So the 80-20 rule says that 80% of your working time is only giving you 20% of your earning potential. And that applies to most people. So actually the 20% of the time that you're putting into your other things that you were doing, and I was looking at all kinds of things then, should be earning you 80% of your income. Wow. So a bit of a light bulb. So I did my little pie chart. So I put in my income, let's say, let's call it 100,000 just to round it up. Just wait I, there, just wait there. That's the pie chart that Nicola got us all to do on the first call, if you remember. No way. No way. <laughs> No way. Oh, yes. Wow, yep. there you go. Wow. <laughs> well, there you go. Well, it stuck, obviously, but it went somewhere for, for 12, 30 years, whatever. Um, brilliant. Oh, my goodness, mate. Right. So I then filled in the other bits of the pie. And I'd already got, uh, I was involved in some network marketing on a very small scale. I wanted to get back into investment, property or whatever in some way. I wanted to sort of reinvigorate all my assets, my published assets, because I'd sort of put quite a lot of those to bed. And then I just thought, mm, I wanted a lump sum of money, just, just a pot of money. Oh, I know, I need to sell something. So then I thought, right, physical products. So I kind of filled in that pie chart set off down that path um but what I quickly realized is is that me being me I'd bitten off far more than I could chew yeah I started off down the path of building an Amazon business yeah so building an Amazon business I, I got really really into because of my partner's illness and, and actually quite a few people around me that have been seriously ill I got really into health nutrition supplements all of that stuff um so I went down the path of having my own private label um products on Amazon spent loads of money on the training and all that brilliant training um but then another um network marketing opportunity came my way which i heard about 10 years earlier knew it was great forgot about it couldn't see how I was going to fit it in and it just kind of came across my horizon and funnily enough all the products that I've been researching as being the ones to go for on Amazon were kind of what they were selling so I thought, oh, okay that's really interesting these guys know what they're doing and oh are you still around because I'd heard about them 10 years earlier so and sorry, just one quick question here. Where yeah. are we date-wise now? How long ago are we? This, this is three years ago. Okay. Almost to the day, to be honest. Okay. Yep. So, um, so I just went for it, basically. And um, what I quickly realized, because I know there's kind of a bit of a love-hate relationship with the network marketing. Some people love it. Some people can't abide it. Um, but I think it's all about, um, you know, perception is projection and all of that kind of stuff. For me what it's done for me is tick, it's ticked a massive amount of boxes and has actually filled in all the segments in my pie because what I realized was that there was a physical product, 
that I, I started to use the product. I know we spoke, that's what we do. I used the product. I started to see my health turn around big time. And I've had years of lethargy and, you know, I used to have to bath my children when I, I'd lie on the bathroom floor. I was so tired and they'd kind of bath themselves. So I've always had low energy and, um, I, and I wanted to do more speaking and writing. And I thought, okay, well, I can do more of that with that. I can also apply my coaching skills to people who actually want to be coached and want to make a difference in their life. So it sort of ticked all the boxes for me. Um, so that's where I'm at now. So fast forward three years, my consultancy, I have sort of knocked on the head unless somebody sends me something very, very tempting. Um, and I've sort of committed myself to that now. Um, so um, why? One, because it's portable. Because I'm already, I know, Judith, you're looking at house sitting. Yeah. Um, I'm really into that whole idea of just going and living somewhere for six months. Um, and I want to be able to do that. A friend of mine's in Italy at the moment doing the same. And I just think, you know, I just, I wanted to have a reason to go somewhere. Let me just ask a quick question there. Um, the portability of a network marketing business, which is physical products based, are yeah. you saying you would sell it to the Italians if you're in Italy or you can sell it globally from wherever you are or both? Both. I can, I can absolutely do both. And that's, that's the idea of it. So, so for me, with, with my company, it's, it is a global company. Um, there, are, there are people who have UK businesses that live in Lanzarote, for instance, yeah, yeah, you know, and yeah. that's the beauty of it. I could go anywhere in the world, pretty much anywhere in the world, um, build a team, build, a, build some, you know, a team of business builders there who want to be successful in their own country. I also have, because we're all, on the, all online now, we've all got our own online shops. So even here now, I can have somebody in America buying from my shop. Yes, because I can do that. Um, yes. But yes, absolutely. I can I can retail in a country. I can build build a retail base up there. But also, I can then leave that country and still maintain that retail uh, business, and then go and live in you know Arizona for six months or yeah. Yeah. Malaysia or whatever. And yeah. um, the thought of building a truly global business and working with people that become friends because they do all across the world and to then have reason to go out there to do coaching and do training and speaking and all of that it massively appeals and and the friends them. are the um downline or the customers or both both ab yeah. ab absolutely both that you know that's the thing because um i've just um uh, i've just sponsored a lady in india who uh, who found me online so she doesn't know me from adam um, she contacted me. We had a good chat about things. She'd lived in the UK last year. Um, very intelligent woman, really, really switched on and um, has gone back home to India and she's, she's just joined the team. So, you know, she's, she's building her own business and we've already clicked and we chat, you know, we chat as friends. Um, I do yeah, I see it. very much yeah. that coaching skills help you. Uh, build a team and and help that team succeed and be successful for you and for themselves yes now yes. How, how is it uh, is it passive because the the, the 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 purchases are recurring once a customer always a customer or is there attrition tell us more about the the, the yeah. detail the, yeah so it very much depends on the business or, or the company that you've gone for so if you've gone for a service based network marketing business which I, I was with previously and don't get me wrong it's a fantastic company I still get residual income from it yeah it just didn't float my boat but it's still a great company yeah so that was a service-based com um, company and people are buying a recurring service every you know every month so yes. that is truly passive yeah different companies have different models so if you if you appreciate with uh, retail, so say it's a health and wellness, not everybody needs to buy their vitamin C every month or no. you yeah. know whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but what you tend to get is, uh, and yes, you do get attrition. You know, you'll get some people that will buy and then not bother for a while. But it's all about relationships, isn't it? Every business yeah. is about relationships. So. Yeah. We're building relationships with our customers because we want to and we want to help them out. And when they're ready and when they need some help, then we help them out. But the law of averages says that if you have a customer base of so much, 
then you'll you know you, you'll you'll be receiving a regular income from people that some are buying every month i have one lady that religiously places an order every quarter you know uh, um but then the residual income in our model means that for all of my team um it's in everybody's interest to help everybody else this is why i love it as a coach and for mm. me for me it's the ultimate coaching business mm. that's why i love it so my team by helping them i receive an income by helping them and by supporting those team members that want to reach a certain level in the marketing plan and uh, and start to build a really serious income i i will support anybody in my team whether they want to earn 200 pounds a month or 20,000 a month or more it, it's irrelevant if they want to work I'll help them but for those that want to really really go for it and go for the six-figure income by supporting them and coaching them to get to that level I then have a residual income a residual income kicks in linked to their business and I can have as many businesses at that level as I choose and do you have for yourself targets of numbers of um coaches or sponsorees i forget what the word is but you know what i'm saying do you <laughs> do you know do you know do you have a chart are you a sort of numbers i think you probably are a numbers yeah, person yeah. so you know yeah, yeah. i'm 50 percent of the way there i'm 25 percent of the way there yeah. how, how do you measure it yeah so we know in the industry per se we know that there are certain numbers and there are certain laws of averages by speak to a certain number of people about the business um yeah 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 like what, oh, you know, all the that. thing about the stones in the pockets and all three. that yeah i love sowing, all of that yeah sowing the seeds you know some will yes. grow some won't all that yeah. so we yeah. know that that's the case but also we we also know within our specific business um i know that if i've got uh, a team member who is who who has a particular goal um and um it depends on the kind of person they are some people are very social some people are very numbers if they're very salesy yep. it's always about money for them yeah they're very salesy they can say i need to earn this a month i need 10 grand a month and i need it by then yeah and, and if they give me those two parameters i can yes. say okay this is what you need to do and, yep. uh, and then my project management kicks in then and we then hatch a plan so that they have they can pick specific retail activities and specific uh, sponsoring and coaching activities that if they follow that plan consistently because that's the key then yeah. they will reach that goal if it's something like I, I, I you know I just want to be at home with my children and I need this or I want to take the children to Disneyland in six months mm. again I can work out exactly how that breaks and down do you care years. Anita do you care whether you get one of the an A or a B of those two types no no uh, and and what and the beauty of it which is why I love it so much is is it doesn't really matter on the personality of the person they can be, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm quite an introvert, as, as we know. <laughs> I love people. I'm quite an introvert. Um, but I also work with people that are really sort of out there, you know. Um, and what, what we do is a really lovely book by a guy called Al Schreiter, who does a lot of network marketing training. And he puts people into colours. And, of course, we're all a bit of a combination, really. But reds are very salesy and need sales targets. And you give them a sales target, they get really fired up on that and they go for it. Um, we have blues who are networkers. They love to connect. So, so a person who loves to connect will build a really, really good network because they like to connect. They like to put people together, like to help each other. You, you know, you can work with them in a particular way. We have other people that are, they want to just help the world and they're not bothered how much, how much money they earn, but they want to say, yeah. Yeah. give money to charity or whatever, or they want to, I mean, I'm, I'm a bit of everything, but I'm quite, we call these yellows and these yellow people want to make a difference to the world. Yeah. So if I, if I meet somebody who's, you know, sick to death of the job, hates the rat race, all of that, and they really just want to be helping the elephants in Africa or whatever, or yes. working with street children, then that's fantastic because I can work with that person and find them the activities whether it's coaching and developing a team or retailing or both, I can find them activities that they will really enjoy that suit their personalities. Okay, I've got one question about when you meet somebody like that who hates their job, and yep. let, let's assume they can't afford to give up their job. Yes. Um, based on matching their income that they take from their job, uh, how, yep. long to, how long to get them out? 18 months faster? What? It, 
it's it's entirely up to their drive their effort, yeah. what absolutely it's, yeah. it's we, we always say it's, it's like getting your pilot's license it's about yeah. putting flying hours in so if you want to get a pilot's license yeah. in a week you're going to go hell for leather you'll go 20 you know 12 hours a day and you'll get you'll get your 60 70 hours i'm sure it's a lot more than that if you haven't got that time you might go for your yes. pilot's license over a year so yeah. i basically ask people three questions when they get started how much do you need to make this worth your while? How yes. much do you want? Yes. How much time per week can you put into this business? Yeah. And and uh, when do you need this money for? When do you need yeah. it? For? And, uh, for do reason. you know what, Anita? I ask them the same questions. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I ask my clients the same questions. Uh, i tell you what I want to say very quickly in observation. There are a couple of women, and I can't remember who the second one is, but the first one is Mary Claire Carlyle, who've mm -hmm. very uh, deliberately and high profilely switched into this model away from their own self-employed activities. And Mary Claire mm -hmm. has been very successful at it, hasn't she? Mm -hmm. Leading a team and demonstrating results at it. Mm -hmm. Tell us a sort of larger, more philosophical piece about how you see network marketing fitting into self-employment in 2018 and beyond. Oh, I absolutely 100 percent believe that it's time has come i absolutely mm. in, in the uk i mean it's it's time has been in america i don't oh. mean been and gone i mean it's been around in america for much longer than here hasn't it, it we've has. been a bit slow at yeah. picking it up in the uk i'll tell you what i've seen and, and i've been involved in network marketing for ooh, since 2006 so i have been around that whole industry for a while what i've seen is um a massive influx of professionals um, because um, the business, uh, I don't think the business has evolved. I think it's always been what it is. I personally don't see network marketing in, in any other way, in some ways, than any other business in the sense yeah. that we all have a range of products and services. We're in business to, you know, hopefully make a profit and make a difference. A lot of people in business want to do that. And that's all we're doing. We're doing exactly the same thing. What I've seen in recent years, are uh, if I said to you, you know, the types of people I've got joining my team and I see joining other teams within our network, it ranges from, you know, stay at home parents who want to stay at home and just need a couple of hundred pounds to enable them to do it. Yeah. We also have solicitors, GPs, surgeons, um, I mean, professionals. Every, yeah. Yeah. every time, yes, the mm. whole spectrum. And what I see is that I think network marketing is a massive leveler. It's a huge level playing field that when people come to see the business and they see what it can do for them and they see that it's actually an incredibly simple business model that anybody can follow if they choose to apply themselves um they, then they get it and they know they can do it so one of the issues for me personally was moving from a professional persona as it were i believed i had to evolve from you know move from being a professional who was working with chief execs and all this malarkey into doing this network marketing and, and i couldn't quite reconcile the two yeah. and actually the more that i've learned about the industry and the, and the business and and um and and you know how serious a business model it is the the more the easier it's become for me to go no actually <laughs> actually this is a great profession and we can hold our head up high because we're making a massive difference to people's lives and anybody can be successful i've got students in my team i've got university students that are absolutely killing it and are people I'm going to say the S word, stigma. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 there is a stigma in the UK, isn't it? And, and people have to get over themselves. Not everybody can yeah. sell. Not everybody can give things away. You know, how do people? Yeah. How do people get round? Get over it. Get round it. Whatever yeah. it is, that kind of blockage we have, that snobbishness. I don't know what it is. Resistance. Yeah. How do we get yeah. over that? I think that, that my experience is that choose. You need to choose a company that you can absolutely yeah. get behind, one hundred percent. Yeah, you absolutely believe in those products, and you can stand up and speak to anybody about them. Yes, and then and then the other thing is 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 to find the methods or find the techniques because the concepts in network marketing are the same. They're the same as any business. Yes. You know, share your products and services with people, with the world, and help others to, to be able to do the same. That's what we yeah. do. Okay. Um, 
but um when i'm coaching somebody i have you know i have a whole sort of buffet <laughs> of techniques so i know for instance if i am working with a gp they will have a completely different network than somebody who runs a hairdressing salon yeah. or who is a student so whilst the concept whilst the business model that i teach and our company teaches is identical across the world it's no different in america than it is in india or the uk or anywhere it's the same business model it's a 40 year old business model that has stood the test of time it mm -hmm. works so we teach exactly the same thing but when we're working with an individual i can work with that person and find um their forum as it were so you know, I love to do speaking, so I will go out and speak to community groups, um, professional groups. I love to do that. Now, that's, you know, a fate worse than death, isn't it, to some people? To some, they, yeah, it is, yeah. They, now, they now can... draw, draw breath for a minute, Donnie, because we're running out of time here. <laughs> I, I've got a gazillion questions I could ask you on this. Nicola's being very quiet because I know it's not her favourite topic now. Mm -hmm. Nicola, do you want to come in here at the end? No, no, I'm fine. I'm just listening with interest. Okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> for which we can read she's just listening Anita. Yes, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um there's there's chapter two in this because there's gazillion questions i want to ask uh, i'm just going to give you one of them now but don't answer it now because mm. we haven't got time mm. I'm, I'm i'm a little bit surprised in this highly regulated world in which you live that gps are even allowed to do this do they have to do it on mm. the side don't answer it but you know what i'm saying there, it's mm. there, there's riveting questions here and i take your point very much and and as a person that sold licenses to to you know run a business to people before it's mm. a great way of teaching people to run the business as well isn't it, is. it? absolutely yeah. It, yeah. it's it's the easiest the simplest way for anybody to go into business yeah frankly okay. and okay. i know that the quick answer is no they don't have to do it on the side <laughs> no i've got to stop you because we've run out of time but i'm very very grateful to you for coming in today but and and obviously making the point very clearly about how it brings your project management your coaching all, all sorts of um, elements mm. of of you um and you can bring those out in your team as well yeah exactly 100 yeah. percent. ticks Good. all the boxes yeah, yeah you're a star thanks so much for being thank here thank you very thank much you. you're welcome okay. thank you Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. So, Nicola, do you have a word of the week? I do. It's craft. And it's a wonderful word that comes from Sean, my, my new hero, <laughs> because he talks about creativity and honing your craft. And that makes being a creative person much more learnable, if you think about it like that. Yeah. Because you know he gives you when you're learning a craft you could you learn tools techniques you have a mentor you have people you aspire to and it just makes it all a lot less nebulous and, and airy fairy and up in the sky and un, undoable unless you're born with a talent well i was going to say unless and you know it, the, the, the whole thing of not being good enough because i was born with a talent you know it's off-putting isn't it it is, yeah, and and you know, I I I just feel that if you can, you know, that ten thousand hours thing and outliers as well, you know, they they talk about people with talent being outstripped by people who who work at own their craft, and I find that very encouraging. So. Yeah, it's a hare and a tortoise, but even people who are talented work hard at it as well. I think I always think of Olympic athletes. You know, they had the talent that you and I didn't. But they have to work like whatever yeah. the work, you know, yeah. like work like anything at at honing their craft. Absolutely, and, and making it the best it can be, because yeah. without work, it, w it wouldn't be half as good as it ends up being. No, and I think since I've known you and since you've known me, we, in areas of our work where we've applied ourselves, our 10,000 hours has paid dividends. Yes, and <laughs> I find it highly hilarious, I must say, that I pick, I've picked a hobby that is quite so difficult. But I'm loving the challenge. I love to learn new things. I love to get my head around new concepts and... Uh, and, and, you know, I, I could have picked something easier, though, couldn't I? Like, I don't know. Well, would you have got bored with it? Yes, I would have got bored I with it. I don't know whether you did pick it or whether it picked you. I think, I don't think we need to go there, to be honest. I'm obviously meant to be a best-selling science fiction author, aren't I? Yes. <laughs> yes, Nicola, she said after a pregnant pause. <laughs> oh, what's your word, then? It's antediluvian. Do you know what that means? Uh, I don't know. It means belonging to the time before the biblical flood or ridiculously old fashioned. And the reason I'm picking it for this week's word is because I had to bank a check on Monday. Oh, good grief.
I haven't seen a check for so long, I can't tell you. And I got myself in quite a panic because I'm going back to that worrying thing, um, because, you know, I don't know where I bank with HSBC and with Halifax. I don't know where the branches are. I don't know where I can park easily because of my knees. Uh, and it was all just too much for me. And I, I, I knew vaguely that you could bank a check at the post office. And there's a post office at the bottom of my road at walkable distance. And I Googled it. And it, the procedure, depending on who you bank with, and you know, obviously there are more banks than my two, is different for each bank. So you have to have a pre-printed um, paying in slip, which is in the back of your checkbook. And of course, I only I used a check this week as well. And the last time I used a check was exactly the anniversary and for the same purpose a year ago. So well, redirect my Royal, Royal Mail redirection. It won't let me pay online because it doesn't like the discrepancy between my address. There's no flat two, so it's always rejected. Oh, yeah. So I have to fill out the form and send it off with a check. So I've used one check in February 2018 and another check in February 2019 for exactly the same purpose. But I had one to bank, so I had to tear the paying out in slip out from the back of my checkbook. I walked down to the post office and the woman gave me an envelope and I had to fill out the thing and, blah, blah, and put it in the envelope and give it back to her. It takes a day longer than taking it directly to the bank, but I didn't have to work out. <laughs> but look at the faff. Now, oh, yeah. if you have a bank app, it becomes clear that all you have to do these days is take a photocopy of the check, you know, a picture of the check and you can bank it like that. But you need a smartphone for that and I haven't got one of those. I was very impressed when I read that, that you could take mm. a picture. Yes, absolutely. Phone. Anyway, so antediluvian is the word. Please don't send me a check. Now, Except the PPI ones. This was my first PPI one that I was banking and they will only pay you online if the person that's refunding you for their poor PPI performance is a bank you bank with. So if I had a claim against HSBC or Halifax, they would pay it directly into my bank. Any one that I don't bank with has to send me a check and I have to take it to the post office. And I, all I'm hoping, Nicola, is I have enough paying in slips in the back of my checkbook to see out the number of claims. <laughs> <laughs> I'm amazed you've still got, oh, you thought you kept it because you might have needed it again, yes. <laughs> well, and I have all sorts of vital information written inside my checkbook, mainly PIN numbers, don't tell anyone. Oh, God! <laughs> <laughs> Now, 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 let's move swiftly along to yeah. project updates. Okay, um, I'm not going to talk about one of my projects because I've talked a lot about that today. I'm going to talk about my client who is at a very difficult stage in her business. She's invested a lot of time and money and she's very passionate about it and she's very committed to it. But we are at the stage now where she is making sales, but not as many as she'd like. And it's we have a little conversation every week, which is about what, what else can we do? And we do other things. So... And we do everything. In fact, she's doing more than anyone else I know in her field. And we are doing as much as we possibly can, you know, with budget constraints allowing, but in, in terms of advertising. But um, it's a difficult one because every client gets to this point where they think, I'm, I'm selling something, I'm selling stuff. It's not as much as I need or want. Is it working? And, and the answer is, yes, it absolutely is working. Someone has bought everything that she's produced um, and more than one someone and she's getting testimonials and she's just got to grit her teeth and keep going because you you know she's actually getting more traffic to her website than I am and she's got more people on her mailing list than I am but because she's new at what she's doing she's not getting as many sales as she would like but it's you know it's getting there and I've never seen anything take off like a rocket like this um, in anything I've worked in so she's just got to keep going really but yeah. it's a difficult yeah. stage for any client really. Yeah, although she's quite a solid woman in terms of gritting her teeth, so you'll probably be all right, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I just I just don't want her to give up too soon because it's not as big as, you know, the clients sort of have this perception in their head, which they never communicate to you, by the way. You, you always um, talk to them about it at the beginning and say, you know, set their expectations time-wise and, and everything. But they, they do form preconceived notions in their head about how much, when... Um, you know, and all that stuff. So you just have to weather those storms when you come to them, really. Yeah. Yeah. What about you? 
Uh, so, well, I did write on Monday this week. It wasn't an inspired post, but it was something I wanted to share about Wayne Dyer's I Ams. And I went on to have a lovely Wayne Dyer influenced day and night. And I woke up feeling the next morning consequently quite fab. And I'm not sure yet whether the feeling of fabness was because of the quite serious amounts of Wayne Dyer I Aming I'd put in, uh, or the thing I'm going to tell you about in a minute, my new probiotic. But I felt able to walk to the post office. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but sometimes my knees are so painful. I can barely make it to the car and that morning I thought oh my knees feel completely different I, I'll walk to the post office I mean that is so rare so thanks for the combination of Wayne Dyer my probiotics and my antediluvian check uh, I went for a little walk and the reason I realized when I went out there why I don't go for a little walk because if you haven't got knees pavements are on a thousand different levels yeah. you know between here in the post office which is I don't know a thousand meters the, the roads dug up there are men down holes. There's muck all over the pavements from the bits they've dug up. There's uh, tree roots coming through the pavement. There's different paving slabs. There's children, teenagers from the local college. Uh, there's bumps on the road where blind people are supposed to hover waiting for the lights to change. There's pavements, there's curves that, you know, it's a very, you know, I'm not even old yet. I mean, when you're old, the world is becomes very unfriendly. Yeah, absolutely. Have you tried see, uh, cannabis oil? Not yet. Oh, might be worth trying. Well, no, I think my probiotics is. I'm going to tell you about that in a minute. But uh, you tell me what, who, or what's impressed you. Well, I spent a delicious nearly three hours last night watching something recommended to me by my son Nelson. Um, it's Joe Rogan and Brian, Professor Brian Cox, talking about. Well, everything, basically. <laughs> Joe Rogan is um, quite a blokey bloke. And I've seen a few of his things when he interviewed Russell Brand, for example. He's got a podcast. And but Professor Brian Cox never fails to delight. And he obviously fascinated him the first time he was on because he's had him back. And they, it really gets going. I've sent the link to put in the show notes. Mm. It really gets going about one hour ten in. I mean, it's great up until that point, but he really gets talking about everything from does you know are there aliens out there does god exist um you know is the power of attraction real you know are there any sort of scientific things you know and then he talks about the things they have discovered as well and how that fits with everything and i just think there wouldn't be a person on the planet who wouldn't get something from that that discussion and joe rogan was so well prepared he had some really deep thoughtful questions that he asked brian cox and he, he just he was, Mr. he was trying to be Mr. Ordinary Everyman, asking the questions that, you know, a lot of people would, would want to ask. But, you know, then when you realise that Brian Cox used to be a keyboard player in D-Ream, it's, it's even more astonishing that he's now a particle physicist. <laughs> astonishing stuff. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Good, good. Um, well, mine is the probiotic, which I told you about last week. I didn't, I, on the podcast, I didn't say that it was a probiotic. I said that I'd bought something from a Facebook ad, which I could see followed those principles that you'd been telling us about for a couple of weeks of uh, Frank Kern. And I've, I saved the ad because I'm sharing it, showing it to my clients as an example of marketing I bought from on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's actually an example of Andre Chaperon. I was going, comma, I was about to say, and when I shared it with one of my clients, she said, oh, this is Andre Chaperon. I said, yes, it is, because Nicola tells me about that too. So yes, we're agreed, it is Andre Chaperon. Yeah. But uh, Frank's been doing it as well, has he not? Uh, he, to a small, much smaller degree. Okay. Do you think he borrowed it from Andre? No, he, he doesn't really do it like Andre at all. Um, okay. He, he's doing the daily um, video live on Facebook, whereas Andre does the series of written letters. Yes. Yes. Anyway, um, anyway, I want to tell you now about the product because um, we, I ordered it on a Tuesday. We spoke about it last Thursday. It arrived on that Thursday through the letterbox, flat packed, so I didn't even need to be in. Uh, I'm on day eight of 12. Um, within days, I felt better. Um, now, I was already taking a probiotic, but it was one of those ones you take every day for the rest of your life and it wasn't doing me any good. This is six days, or if you want, 12. And then you can take it again later in your life if you have, say, if you have for any reason to take antibiotics, which I've never have, or um, you have a sort of bingy Christmas and you want to have a clear out January, or you've been poorly. But you don't need to take this forever. You can do it in six days. And within two or three, I could feel a lot of 
a lot of impact on my health because you know that your gut health now is we're being told is mm. responsible for everything yeah. Yeah. from gum disease to heart disease to mental well-being to physical well-being to how your tummy feels a lot of my clients have difficulty with 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 tummy issues we won't go into it um anyway i've been back to his website and his facebook page to see if he has an affiliate scheme and he doesn't yet but it's it looks like a one-man band it's um when the product arrives it just gives you enough inf it's beautifully packaged it just gives you enough information and no more it says on the side you know sugar-free gluten-free yeast-free dairy-free soy-free uh, it gives you very simple instructions. You do have to take 10 pills in the morning on an empty stomach, which is quite a lot. And they're in that sort of plasticky, you know, outer coating. And you think, oh, God, have they got stuck halfway down? But the, the and I must warn everybody who's listening to this before they write in and said, oh, tell me about it, Judith. I am very susceptible. So if you give me in a strong message, this is why I haven't done cannabis oil yet. If you give me in a strong message, this is going to fix you, Judith. It fixes me because I, I'm very, well, susceptible. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I'm chuffed to bits with it. I'm not reporting the final results yet because it's only day eight of 12, but this time next week, I will. Yeah, I, w I, I did think it was a very compelling offer when I read the- I agree. Marketing materials. Yeah. And, it, and it, that, that compelling offer, that professionalism carries through everything, the product, the packaging, the delivery, the results. Mm. Very good. Well, I'll yeah. be interested to see because, um, yeah. you know, that, like you say, it, it's, it's six or 12 days, was it? Yeah. Yeah. Six, really. I think I'm only taking 12 because I've been under the weather in several sort of petty fogging little ways for quite a long time. So I thought, well, I'll back my double, double my insurance, as it were. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It honestly doesn't speak to me. Uh, I think I know that somebody I know who um, has had cancer and it's often recommended yes. for that. Yeah. Um, she withdrew herself from her UK treatment and went to Europe for it. But she told me the best way to use cannabis oil and it isn't something i would enjoy doing to myself <laughs> i think i can guess yeah um and also again i think you're always looking for the cure to which you feel drawn and i'm aware of cannabis oil but i don't feel drawn to it I, I'm, I'm not all i think what my friend who went to europe for a treatment says is what's generally available in the uk isn't very efficacious I think you could shop around a lot. Ditto with probiotics. You could shop around a lot and get mediocre, is it working, isn't it working types. Um, but when I, when I spoke to my friend and she told me exactly what sort of type and what sort of strength and where you need to put it and how it's supposed, i.e. swallowing it, won't really do much good. Uh, it put me off, to be honest. But, but, you know, it's nice to know there are things out there, isn't it? Well, I'll let you know how, how her husband's pain is. Indeed, indeed. Okay, good stuff. That's us done. See you. Bye. How do they do it? Not a care and suffering. Wanna step into the world. You've been listening to Nicola Cairncross and Judith Morgan. The podcast is called Own It, Your Business and Your Life. Do come and visit us at ownitpodcast.com. We'd love to hear your feedback. You can find out more about Judith and visit her on her website at judithmorgan.com and you can find Nicola at nicolacairncross.com. 